Uh, I'm going to talk about the observability of the glorious future. Um, you may experience a little bit of cognitive dissonance during this talk, since you're probably familiar with Liz's slide styles and her general even-handedness and general diplomatic approach. Um, I have tried to play Liz on TV. It didn't really fool anyone. Uh, so anytime you see an annoying little pony pop up, uh, mouthing off, uh, that's my commentary on Liz's slides. Uh, but I, I did really want to give this talk because I, you know, a lot of people have questions about, you know, how does observability really play out, you know, in, in how does it change the way we build and ship uh, and own our software? And, and I love this talk because it gives a little bit of an overview of how we do these things at Honeycomb. So you can see how, what it actually looks like to be on a high performing team and, um, and how it can actually make your life better. So um, to start off with, um, you know, observability, everybody here has probably heard me talk about observability and, and what it is. So um, <laughs> there's my little pony. Um, observability, you know, everything's moving very quickly. Uh, your, your bugs are always going to be moving more quickly than, than, than you are. Um, observability is really the ability to understand our systems without deploying new instrumentation, right? Um, the problem space is super complex. We care about predictable releases. We care about quality code. We care about managing tech debt, operational resilience, and user insights. Um, observability is not the frosting that you put on the cake after you bake it, the way we used to do with you know monitoring checks, uh, very much treating our systems as, as black boxes. It's very much about ensuring their code is written correctly, performing well, and doing its job for each and every single user. Your code goes in from the IDE, and it comes out your observability tool. Code that's just in your IDE is dead code, right? Code that hasn't been shipped is dead code. It, it, it's nothing until it's interacting with your environment and users. How do you get your developers to instrument their code? How do you store all this metadata about the data? Um, and of course, none of it really matters if you can't actually ask the right questions when, when you need to. And anybody who tells you that you can just buy their tool and get a high-performing engineering team is, selling you something and it won't work. Um, a lot of people seem to feel like these three things are in tension with each other, velocity, uh, reliability, and scalability. Um, we would beg to differ. Um, when it comes to like Honeycomb's team, we have a very small, we have a smallish engineering team. So we have to be very deliberate about where we, where we invest our time. And we need to focus on automation that speeds us up instead of slowing us down. We have about, 120 people now and about 50 engineers, which is four times as many engineers as we had just two years ago. Um, we are six years in now. And for the first four years, we seriously only had like four to 10 people um, uh, writing code. And sales used to beg me not to tell anyone how few engineers we had. Whereas I always wanted to like shout it from the rooftops. Like, can you believe the shit that we have built and how quickly we could move? Like, I used to love it when you know, people would be like, oh my God, I thought you had 50 engineers because we only had like 12. Um, but one of the things that has always helped us compete is that we don't have to think about deploys. You merge some code, it gets rolled out to dog food and then production automatically. And on top of that, obviously we comfortably deploy on Fridays because why wouldn't you? Like, why would you sacrifice 20% of your velocity? Worse yet, why would we let merges pile up until, one, until Monday? Instead, we deploy every weekend Every, every weekday and avoid deploy weekends. This is my alter ego. <laughs> I, I love her. Um, but this is what the, that looks like. This is a screenshot of Honeycomb uh, of build IDs, count distinct of build IDs for production. Uh, so this graph shows the number of distinct build IDs running in our systems every day. We ship somewhere between 10 and 14 times per day. And this is what high agility looks like when you've got you know, a dozen engineers. Um, and despite this, we almost never have emergencies that you know, we can deploy. Wait, 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 did I say despite? <laughs> I mean, because of this, <laughs> because of this, we almost never have emergencies that need uh, we can deploy. Because when it comes to software, speed is safety. It's like ice, ice skating or bicycling. If you speed up, it gets easier. If you slow down, if you get less predictable, you get wobblier and you fall off your bike. And we've been doing all of this while traffic has been surging and all of this during the pandemic. <laughs> uh, rights have tripled. Our read workload is, um, you know, 
doubling multiply it three to five times. That's a lot of scaling for a team to do on the fly. Look, we have not been hiring over this time. While shipping product constantly and also laying the foundation for future product work, you know, by refactoring and paying down debt. Um, so, you know, we talk a pretty big game. We do literally deploy from cron. <laughs> this was one of the first things I did six and a half years ago when I was setting up the system is I, I got really tired of, of deploying the code. So I, I set up a little bash script that runs from cron every hour. And if there are any changes um, to, to, to main, it, it deploys them. Um, and this sort of thing can be very difficult to, ro to roll out later. But if you grow up with it, it's the easiest way to ever ship code and you never want to live any other, any other way. So like I said, how do we balance all these competing priorities? How do we know where to spend our incredibly precious, scarce hours? Development cycles are the most, uh, they're the rarest resource in your, in your book, right? So it starts with you know, quantifying what does reliability actually mean for us. This doesn't just mean tech, it also means like the cultural processes that actually reflect our values. We know that we prioritize very high agility on the product, as well as maintaining reliability. It's, you know, we, we, are, we are an infrastructure company. Um, so it's really about figuring out that sweet spot where we can maintain both, which requires continuous improvement, which means addressing the entropy that inevitably takes hold in the systems. We have to actively look at what's slowing us down from shipping and invest our time in fixing that stuff when it starts to have an impact, not before. <laughs> but wait, if you wait for it to page you, when you exam before you examine your code, it's like, it's like waiting for a quadruple bypass surgery instead of you know, eating your vegetables and getting, you know, getting your, your blood pressure taken. Um, you, the very nature of paging, it means that um, it's got to be rare, it's got to be infrequent, it's got to be the exception. And, and what that means is there are so many things happening underneath the covers in the system at all times. There are so many bugs in your system right now that you have no idea about because you can't hope to page everyone anytime there's a bug. People will just be running around constantly like, like a chicken with their head cut off. Um, this is why they suffer. Teams have to get used to, you know, it used to be in the monitoring days that we would tell people, you don't need to look at graphs all day, you know, do your job, look at your code, and when something's wrong, it'll page you. This is actually not true. You, this, and this is why we suffer, right? You have to be actively going and looking at your telemetry, looking at your instrumentation, and saying, is it doing what I expected? Does anything else look weird? Then we design experiments to probe this risk. Um, outages are <laughs> just experience you didn't think to try. And then we address them, right? So how broken is too broken? Um, how do we measure this? Because, you know, reliability is not about not failing. Reliability is about failing a lot um, without your users ever noticing. Uh, the system should survive lots of failures. You should never be alerting on symptoms, right? How do you come we use service level objectives? Um, this is a common language for engineering and business stakeholders to agree upon. We define what success means according to the business. We measure it with our system telemetry throughout the life cycle of a customer. That's how we know how well our systems are doing, and it's how we can measure the impact of changes. SLOs are like an API that you can use as a team to talk about service health and liability. They're the, SLOs are like the API between teams. They allow you to budget and prepare instead of just reacting and arguing. They also are the way that teams can collaborate with each other without having to know about the inner workings or decision-making processes, right? If you're not hitting your SLO, you automatically work on reliability. Um, this means that you don't need to argue with other teams about you know, whether or not they're going to spend time on your priorities because you, you've agreed on this. So um, when it comes to instrumentation, it's all about the context. It's all about events. Um, these arbitrarily wide structured data blobs are, um, they are the beating heart of observability, rich context um, oriented around the perspective of each user that is, you know, when the request enters the system, uh, you, you need to capture one wide event per request per service. I don't know if you all have seen my rants. I'm assuming you have. If not, I've written blog posts about this. Um, metrics won't cut it. <laughs> Logs won't cut it. You need arbitrarily wide structured data blobs if you're going to have actual observability. And anybody who says you don't is selling something. Um, 
so you capture these white events, and then you then you sort them into good or bad, right? Um, Honeycomb's SLOs are designed to reflect the user experience, and the strictness of those SLOs reflects the reliability that each user expects from your service. SLOs serve zero purpose unless they reflect actual customer pain and experience. The, the goal of like um, paging yourself when something is about to be felt by a customer, that's the pipe dream. <laughs> Don't try. Um, page yourselves when actual customers are feeling actual pain. Honeycomb's goal as a product is to help you run your systems humanely without waking you up in the middle of the night by ingesting telemetry, enabling data exploration, and making it easy to explore that data by asking ad hoc novel questions, not just pre-aggregated query outs on, on dashboards, but anything you might think of. Um, then we make your queries run performantly so that you feel empowered as an engineer to understand what's happening in your system. You know, when you're debugging something, when you're in the state of flow, you want to be asking questions like, what about this? What about this? What about this? You know, you're following a trail of breadcrumbs. Exploration requires sub-second results. This is not an easy problem. Especially if you're running a system at scale. It's actually one of my favorite things. <laughs> Many people actually don't believe that Honeycomb is capable of doing the things we claim. Um, Christine was sitting by a CTO of a company that will remain unnamed the other night at a dinner. And, and he was just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody can make a demo look good, but like we run at scale and we're like, well, you know, we run, we run Slack's metrics, you know, we, we run, we run all these big companies, we are running the combined production workloads of like 350 companies. And, you know, our 95th percentile query latency is about two seconds. And I just straight up don't believe it. So I am going to give you a slight overview of how that works under the hood, um, just so that you can believe it. Um, but what Honeycomb does is we ingest the telemetry, um, we store it and enable real-time querying. So Honeycomb's SLOs like our does the homepage load quickly, our you know, user run queries, they should return results very quickly. And you know, customer data that we're trying to ingest should be stored fast and successfully. These are the things that our product managers and customer success teams talk about a lot with engineering. Um, now, once in a while, a, a customer right one runs some query of some crazy, crazy complexity over the past two months. That can take up to 10 seconds. That's fine, right? It's okay if one fails once in a while. Um, it's not okay if customer's data doesn't get ingested and written out of the desk immediately. We want to get it out of our customer's RAM and into Honeycomb as quickly as possible. So, you know, um, fortunately, like services are rarely 100% up or down. Uh, and if services are degraded by 1%, then we have 4,300 minutes to investigate and fix the problem uh, instead of, you know, if it's 100% if it's down. Um, so this is why we sort queries into good and bad, right? Um, this helps us make failure budgets explicit, which helps us decide these, customer, these customers impacting questions about where we spend our engineering effort. Too much is as bad as too little, right? which is why we need to induce risks in order to rehearse these outages so that we can move faster on because we're doing them under controlled circumstances. So how do we stay within the SLO? Um, you can have many small breaks, but not big breaks, right? Elite teams can afford to fail quickly. Our recipe, well, instrument as we code, we practice observability-driven development. Before we even start implementing a feature, we ask, how is this going to behave in production? And then we add instrumentation for that. Um, we don't stop there. Uh, we lean on our tests. A lot of people act like what I'm telling them is to stop testing. And that's not, that's not it at all. Um, write your tests, but know when you're achieving diminishing returns with them, right? You need both meaningful tests and rich instrumentation so that you know when it's in production, you can you can test in production too. And this doesn't mean clicking around. You don't want any actual people to be gating between the code and reaching production. This means libraries and, and user stories. We also factor our code to make it easy to use feature flags, which allows us to separate deploys from releases and helps manage the blast radius of changes. We can roll out new features as no ops, then we can turn on a flag in a specific environment or for a canary subset of traffic and ramp it up to everybody. 
<laughs> this is one of my favorite stickers. That union of te technology and humans is what makes our system, uh, our team a socio-technical system. Um, all of our builds need to complete within 10 minutes so that you aren't gonna get distracted and walk away. If your code reviewer asks for a change, you can get to it quickly. It's all about these tight feedback loops that sit at the very heart of your socio-technical systems, keeping them tight and fast and compact. Make sure that everything you're still thinking about is still in your head <laughs> from the moment that you've written it until it's in, in your production. Once the CI is green and the reviewers are thumbs up, you merge your changes to green. No, wait till after lunch or let's do it tomorrow because you want to push and observe those changes while the concept is still super fresh in your heads. So we merge our changes and automatically deploy every day of the work week. We'll talk more about how our code auto updates across environments and some of the situations where we'll do a rollback or pin a specific version. Um, we, we don't roll it out directly to production. Um, the way Honeycomb is, is we have production environment, then we have the dog food environment, which monitors all of production, and then we have kibble, which monitors all of dog food. So we first roll out the code to kibble, then after like an hour, if you know there are no, you know, errors or problems, then it automatically promotes to dog food, and then it automatically later promotes to production. And finally, we bring it full circle. We observe the behavior of our changes in production using the implementation that we added at the beginning. Your job is not done until you close the loop and observe it in prod. So you check it right away, and then a little bit later to see how it's doing with real traffic and real users. It's not no Friday deploys. It's don't merge and run, right? I don't want you to be deploying at 2 p.m. on a Tuesday if you're going to leave for a dentist appointment in 15 minutes, right? Um, if you're if you're in the office at, or if you're working from home at 4 p.m. on Friday and you're on a roll and you want to deploy, it's fine. The whole point here is about you know increasing ownership. It's about helping to build your judgment as an engineer, not giving you these you know strict parameters and rules that you have to fit between and then not think about it, right? It's all about increasing your awareness of what's going on, not decreasing it. All of our infrastructure is also code under version control. All changes are subject to peer review and go through the build process. It's like gardening. You have to be proactive, right, about pulling weeds. On top of that, we use cloud services to manage our Terraform state. We used to have people just applying their infrastructure changes from the local dev environments using their individual AWS credentials. But with a central place to manage these changes, we can do things like you know, limit our human AWS permissions to be much safer. We use Terraform Cloud because they're kind of the experts on Terraform. So we don't have to spend a bunch of engineering resources standing up systems to manage our Terraform state for us. That's great. Um, we can turn off AWS turn on our Roth AWS spot in our auto scaling groups and feature flags will let us say, hey, under certain certain circumstances, let's stand up a special fleet. Uh, it's pretty dope that you can use Terraform variables to control whether or not infrastructure is even up. Uh, and we can automatically provision ephemeral fleets to catch up if we fall behind in our most important workloads, like say ingesting um, um, telemetry. Like like the other day, you know, we, we had um, I think it was Slack that did a, this huge backfill and, and we literally doubled uh, the amount of events that we were processing for about an hour or two and nobody even noticed <laughs> uh, because, because the magic did its job. Um, this also helps us quarantine. Like if we have a misbehaving user, um, we, can, we can quarantine them to a subset of our, of our infrastructure. We can set up a set of paths to get quarantined so we can keep it from crashing the main fleets, or we can do more rigorous testing on them. It is possible to both do some crazy shit in production and also protect your users from the noticeable effects. Um, so, you know, that we can then like go in and, and observe with a magnifying glass how, our, how their behavior affects our systems using things like CPU profiling or memory profiling, um, but prevent, prevent this from affecting our other users. And then we validate our expectations. We experiment using error budgets. You may be familiar with the four key Dora metrics and the research that was published in Accelerate. Um, these metrics aren't independent data points. Um, and they aren't in tension with each other. You can actually create awesome, like positive virtuous cycles when you improve one of those metrics. Um, you improve one, you improve the other, and, and they all like they they all feed off each other. So 
if you and, and then if you have some extra budget, right? This is the other beautiful thing about using SLOs is they give you a budget and then you have some leftover. When you have a leftover error budget, stick some chaos in there. Chaos engineering is supposed to be engineering. It's not just supposed to be pure chaos, right? And if you don't have observability, um, you probably just have chaos. Uh, even if you have pretty, you know, respectable monitoring systems and, you know, metrics and dashboards, I'm going to say if you don't have white events, if you don't have the ability to slice and dice and see down to the individual request level, you know, what is going on specifically, um, I wouldn't perform chaos engineering experiments. Um, I've heard too many stories of people who did things in production and then, you know, two or three or four weeks later, realize that some, you know, after effect of their of their chaos engineering experiment was still running and it was, you know, covered over by that they couldn't see it because all they had was aggregates. Anyway, um, feature flags um, help us experiment on a subset of users or on internal users. Um, internal users are always your best, your best ever test users, right? This works really well for stateless stuff. Um, but less well, I'm anticipating your objections, less well when each request is not independent or when you have data sitting on disk, when you're trying to mutate something or store something, right? So how do we handle a data-driven service that allows us to become confident in the service? Um, well, all of our front-end services towards the top here, um, they're all stateless, of course, but then we also have a lot of Kafka, Retriever, and MySQL. Kafka, uh, Retriever being our, our you know, the storage engine that we've written ourselves to, to store all this data. So we deploy our infrastructures incrementally to reduce the blast radius. Um, we're able to do this because we do it automatically multiple times a day. Um, and we can test the effects of changes to our infrastructure with lower risk. So let's zoom in on the, the staple part of this diagram. <clears throat> what that looks like is the data flows into Shepard. Uh, Shepard is our API service. Now, you know, this on the left, on the very left, this is a batch of events. Um, so what do we do with these events? Well, we split them apart and then we send them to the appropriate partition. Um, the middle tier here is Kafka. Within a given Kafka partition, events are here are preserved in order. This is important because if you don't have a de deterministic ordering, it's very hard to ensure data integrity because you won't have an identified or reliable source of where is this data coming from and what should I expect to see. Um, the indexing workers will then decompose them into one file per column per set of attributes. So the service name comes in from, you know, service name, in quotes, comes in from multiple events. And then on each indexing worker, for the retrievers on the right here, um, service name um, becomes, becomes its own file that is appended to in order as a column, based on the order it's read off from Kafka. It's, it's a columnar store, basically. And then we'll eventually go and tail it off to AWS S3. So what are the risks in this system? Well, Kafka doesn't change much. We update it maybe every couple of months, right? It, it changes on the order on the time frame of um, package updates, version updates, operating system updates. There are also very stable machines that don't change very often. Unlike Shepard, which we run in spot instances and it's constantly churning, we make sure that Kafka is in stable machines. They rarely get restarted without us. But we need to make sure that we can survive the disappearance of any individual node while also not having our nodes churn too very often because you know it takes time to move a lot of data around. So there's this very delicate failover dance that has to happen whenever we lose a stateful node, whether that is Kafka, Zookeeper, or Retriever. So what happens if we lose a Kafka broker? This little dude in the middle here is exploding. What's supposed to happen, of course, is that all brokers have replicas on other brokers. When there's a new Kafka node available, it receives all of the old partitions that the old Kafka node is responsible for, and it may or may not eventually get promoted to leader in its own due time. If we lose an indexing worker from Retriever, well, for starters, we don't run a single indexer per partition, we run two. Um, and the other thing that's supposed to happen is we're supposed to be able to replay and restore the indexing worker either from a peer, this is the original design about five years ago, uh, where we just are sync from, from, from your buddy or from file system snapshots. Um, and either way, you have a stale set of data that you're playing from a backup. And now the ordering of that partition 
com becomes very important, right? Because you know where you snapshotted and you can replay that partition forward. And you're, if your snapshot is no more than an hour or old, then you only really have to replay the most recent hour. So great in theory. How can we test this? <laughs> so this is the this is really the fun part of the of the talk where I'm going to talk about how we continuously test our Kafka's and our retrievers to make sure that they're doing what we expect. Woo! <laughs> I love the little dude She's diving in the pool. First of all, it's important to know that we are testing, not destroying, right? So one server from one service at a time. These are calculated risks, so you know, let's calculate. Um, Secondly, it's very important that we do these, these tests at 3 p.m., not at 3 a.m. Uh, we want to help people practice when they, things go wrong. So we want to practice when everyone's awake and available. We also want to practice under peak condition. We've had some issues in the past where, you know, we were testing things during off hours or we had outages during off hours, but then when they would happen again at, during, you know, peak, peak time, um, it wasn't, you know, we didn't have enough, enough headroom. Uh, we want everyone to be awake, of course. And we need to be monitoring our SLIs. Monitoring isn't a bad word, <laughs> as much as I may complain about it. It just is an observability, right? So monitor our SLIs. Um, and really, I think of SLOs as being the modern form of, of the final form, if you will, of monitoring. So we monitor with, with SLOs, and then we debug with an observability because when something does go wrong, it probably isn't something that you anticipated, which means that you can't rely on your dashboards. You need to rely on your instrumentation and your rich events to explore and ask new questions. It's also, it's not just enough to test the node. What if you replace a Kafka node, but the node continues reporting that it's healthy? Even if it got successfully replaced, this can really inhibit your ability to debug. Um, so we think it's important to use chaos engineering, not just to test our systems, but also to test our ability to observe our systems. Um, if something broke and you fixed it, you can't assume that it's fixed until you try breaking it again. So let's talk about this hypothesis again. What if you lose a copy node and the new one doesn't come back up? Um, this is where it turns out like testing your automatic Kafka balancing is super important. We've got all kinds of interesting things that happened inside the Kafka rebalancer just by killing nodes and seeing whether they come back successfully or not and whether they start serving traffic again. And we need to know this because if there's a major outage and we aren't able to reshuffle the data on demand, this is going to be a really serious emergency. It can manifest as everyone else's disks filling up really rapidly. If you now have five nodes now consuming the data that's normally handled by six, and if you're doing this during daytime peak, and if you're also trying to catch up a brand new Kafka broker at the same time, that can overload the systems on multiple levels. You can saturate the NICs, you can run out of disk space, in a, in a way that's really catastrophic for your business. Let's talk about another category of failures that we found through testing. Um, so Honeycomb lets our customers send themselves alerts on any defined query if something is out of bounds, according to the criteria that they gave us. And we want you to get exactly one alert, right? Not duplicate alerts, not zero alerts. So how do we do this? Well, we rely on our, our old friend Zookeeper, Oh my God, I can't believe it's 2022 and we're still running Zookeeper. Um, we're running Zookeeper and we elect a leader to run the alerts for a given minute using Zookeeper. Because Zookeeper is redundancy, right? Well, let's kill it and find out. Oops, the alerts didn't run. Why? Well, turns out the alerting workers were configured to try to talk to index zero only. We killed a note twice, no problem. Third time, we killed index zero. No alerts. <laughs> so we replaced index node zero and the learning workers didn't run. And fortunately, we got to discover this at 3 p.m., not 3 a.m. This is definitely a bug that would have eventually bitten us in the ass and made customers very unhappy. Uh, mitigation, of course, was just to make sure that the Zookeeper client is talking to all the other Zookeeper nodes. So, our previous design for retrievers was that if one went down, the other would R sync off its buddy to recover. But what if you lose two indexing workers at the same time from the same partition? Eh, that will never happen, right? <laughs> so as we were cycling our retriever feet, you know, in the middle of moving them to new class of businesses, 
um, wouldn't it be nice if it didn't feel like stepping very, very carefully through a crowded minefield of danger to make sure you never hit two of the same kind? What if instead of just having to worry about your peers all the time, you could just replay up to eight of your snapshot? It makes your bootstrap choice a lot more reliable. The more workers that we have over time, the scarier this was going to become. So, you know, by snapshotting, now we're able to do a lot of things where we can re restore workers on demand and, and continuously test them, which brings us to the next point. Um, nowadays, you know, after, after a slew, after years of just like having to handle these things in the middle of the night, we now have a, have a cron job where every Monday at 3 p.m. we automatically kill the oldest retriever node. And it comes up and provisions itself. And every Tuesday at 3 p.m. we kill the oldest Kafka node and it goes down and reprovisions itself. This way we can verify continuously that our node replacement systems are always working properly and we're adequately provisioned to handle losing a node during our peak systems. Now, how often do you think we get paged about this at night? <laughs> it's been a long time. Um, finally, we also want our user queries to return really fast, right? But we're not strict about this. So we want 99% of queries to return results in less than, you know, 10 seconds. Um, and what happens when you have a lot of confidence in your system's ability to continuously repair and flex? Well, you get to deploy lots of fun things to help make your life easier and make your service performant and, and cost less. Out of this entire diagram, our entire forward tier has been converted into spot instances, which are preemptible AWS instances. They, they recover very easily from being restarted, so we can take advantage of that whole 60% cost savings. Also, three of these services are running on the Graviton2 class, um, knowing that we, if there's a problem, we could easily revert to the, to the last class. And switching to Graviton, is, if you've been following Liz for a while, you, you've seen the results of these exper experiments. Um, having rolled that out, it saved us another 40% off of our bill. Having the ability to take that leftover error budget from our SLOs and turn it into innovation or turn it into cost savings, this is how you justify being able to set that error budget and experiment with it. Use it for the good of your services and for the good of your teams. But not every experiment succeeds. You can mitigate the risks, but that doesn't mean they succeed. So uh, the last thing I'm gonna do here is talk about a couple of case studies of failures and what we learned from them. Um, three things went catastrophically wrong where we were at risk of violating one of our SLOs. Um, and what's cool about these is they were all, these are all things that, you know, we found via our SLOs, we debugged them using observability, and we relied on our error budgets um, to experiment with and, and recover from. So, you know, I told you about Shepard, it's our API, right, API service. Um, for Graviton2, we first decided to try things out in Shepard because it's the highest traffic and it's also relatively straightforward. It's, it's, it's a very simple API, right? It's stateless, it scales on CPU. It's optimized for throughput first and then latency. We care a lot about getting data out of your RAM, sucking it out of there onto our disks very fast, right? And uh, we used to use a compressed JSON payload that was transmitted over HTTPS. However, there's this new standard you may have heard of called Open Telemetry, which is a vendor neutral mechanism for transmitting, collecting data out of services, including tracing data and metrics. It supports gRPC based protocols over HTTP2. And our customers have been asking for this for a while. We knew it would be better and more effective for them in the long run. So we decided to make sure we could ingest not just our old HTTPS JSON protocol, but also the newer gRPC protocol. So we said, OK, let's go. Turn on a gRPC listener. OK, it works. Great. <laughs> Except, <laughs> Except it was binding on a privilege port, and it was crashing on startup. Um, we managed to stop the deploy in time, thanks to a previous outage we had had, where we pushed out a bunch of binaries that didn't build. So we had put some health checks in place that would stop it from rolling out any further. Whew, that's the good news. The bad news is the new workers that were starting up were getting the new binary, and those workers were all failing to serve traffic. And not only that, but because they weren't serving any traffic, the CPU usage was zero. So the auto AWS autoscaler was like, hey, let's take that service and turn it down. You definitely aren't using it. <laughs> so latency facing our end users went really high and it took us more than 10 minutes to remediate it, which completely blew out our SLO uh, error budget. Oof. So what do we do? 
Well, the ESRI book says freeze deploys. We say, dear God, no, don't do this. <laughs> do not do this. Um, when you freeze deploys, more and more product changes are just going to pile up. And that means that your risk is just going to increase. Code ages like fine milk, right? So instead, um, we recommend changing the nature of your work from product features to reliability work. But using your normal deploy pipeline, right? Don't freeze it. Just change the nature of the work that you're doing. Uh, it's not stopping your work. And it's not setting traps for your users by just, you know, blissfully pounding out features and hoping someday they work in production. Should we delay the launch? That's our other option. We considered that, but that really sucks because this was actually a really important launch for a partner of ours, and we knew that our users really wanted it. Um, third option, get creative. Fortunately, we had decoupled deploys from releases, you know, using, um, using um, feature flags. So we decided instead to apply infrastructure feature flagging. We decided to send the experimental path to a different set of workers to send all HTTP2 gRPC traffic to a dedicated branch. That way we can keep the 99.9% .9 of users that are using JSON traffic, you know, perfectly stable because we're teeing that traffic for them at the low balancer level. This is how we ensure that we can reliably serve as well as experiment. So there are still some risks, right? Um, we had to ensure that we were continuously integrating both branches together. We had to make sure that we had a mechanism for turning it down over time. But these risks are very manageable compared to the risk of either not doing the relaunch at all or freezing releases. Uh, failure number two, um, Kafka data bus. This failure was an example of making decisions on our error budget, which turned out to be insufficient. Um, this, this outage, um, was, Kafka is our persistence layer, and once Shepard has all of our all of our service names are named after dogs, by the way, in case you notice, uh, Retriever, Poodle, Labrador, Beagle, of course, we're, we're a dog company. Um, but once the API, uh, once Shepard is handed off to Kafka, the Shepard will wait, and it won't drop data, right? It's already been safely dropped into the queue. It's waiting for a Retriever indexer to pick it up. Decoupling these components provides a lot of safety. It means we can restart either producers or consumers more or less on demand. They'll be able to catch up and replay and get right back to where they need to be. Kafka has a cost though, which is complexity. Um, we were having scalability issues with our Kafka and needed to re-improve the reliability of them by consolidating them. Instead of having 30 Kafka nodes with very, very large SSDs, we realized that because we we're only really replaying the most recent hour or two of data, unless something goes catastrophically wrong, um, on SSD. Um, so not only that, but they're, they're out of these 30 individual Kafka brokers. If any one of them went bad, you would be in the middle of reshuffling nodes. And then if you lost another one, it would be sitting idle because you can't do a Kafka rebalance while another rebalance is in process. So fewer nodes are, are better than more. So first we tried tiered storage, which would let us shrink from 30 nodes to six Kafka nodes. And the distance of those Kafka brokers might be larger, but not five that's larger. So, you know, instead we're sending that extra data off to AWS S3. Then Liz, loving ARM64 so much, was like, why are we even using these monolithic nodes and local disks? Isn't EBS enough? Can't we use the highest compute power nodes and the highest data, like the highest performance for data perf? Uh, so now we're doing three changes at the same time, <laughs> right? <laughs> we're, we're downsizing from 30 nodes to six, we're trying tiered storage, and we're moving to, you know, options to board EDS. Um, we were actually testing Kafka and Graviton too, too even before Confluent did. Um, but we changed too many things at a time. Uh, we also tried the architecture switch, that, right, from I3N to, to, um, uh, to, uh, to the EB64, Arch64, ARM64. Um, we also introduced AWS Nitro, the hypervisor. Now, we actually published a, a blog post of this experiment as well as a full incident report. Um, if you're interested, scan that thing, I'll take you right to it. I highly recommend if, you're, if you love rubbernecking and or Kafka, um, read it, you'll better understand the decisions that we made. TLDR. <laughs> TLDR, it exploded on us, all of it. Like we thought we'd be right-sizing CPU and disk. Um, instead, we blew out the network dimension. We blew out the IOPS dimensions. Now, technically, we did not blow our SLO through any of this, um, you know, because all, our ingest kept working, you know, 
all of our SLOs for our users were fine, except there is another hidden SLO, right? And that SLO is that, you know, we try not to page people on our team more than twice a week. Uh, we try to make it so that every engineer doesn't have to work an incident out of hours no more than every, you know, once every four to six months. Um, and, you know, they're on call every couple of months. So you should really have no more than one or two of these, you know, shifts that have serious outages, you know, and we had to call a halt to, it, to the experiment because we were changing, changing dimensions at once, chasing extra performance, and it, it just wasn't worth it. It, you know, we weren't burning out our, our technical SLOs, but we were burning out our human SLOs. We have pretty good, I think, incident response practices. We, we have latest retrospectives, you know, we had people handing off work to each other saying, you know what, I'm too tired, I can't work on this anymore. We had people taking breaks afterwards. You know, one of our company values is that we hire adults and, and, you know, this means taking care of each other. This means taking care of ourselves. One of our company policies is, you know, please expense your, your meals for yourself and your family during an incident, because, you know, God knows you don't need one more fire in the kitchen to be handling. Um, you know, so incidents happen. We had existing practices that helped a lot. Um, you know, the meal policy is one of those things that just made sense once somebody articulated it. Um, so document and make these things official policies, um, often they're just unspoken agreements and assumptions, right? All these things are, are, are fine and good, but in the end, we were pushing your people too hard, too hot, and we just needed to, we just needed to back the fuck off, right? We rushed a little in doing this. Um, tight feedback loops help us, you know, we were doing too many things at once, um, and and it was just unnecessarily. You, you really need to have tight feedback loops. You really need to isolate your variables. Some things just require observation over time, right? Isolating your variables also makes it a lot easier for people to update their mental models as changes go out. The last outage is Retriever. Um, its job is to index data, index it, and make it available for serving. Uh, Jess and Ian did this amazing talk at Strangely recently. If you're curious about this, you should absolutely look it up because it's fantastic. Um, retriever fans out to potentially like you know, tens of thousands or millions of individual call files that are you know eventually stored in AWS S3. So you know we kind of serverless our database. <laughs> we adopted AWS Lambda and serverless to like massively parallel compute and demand to, to like read through all of these files in S3. And because we had seen really great results with ground time too for EC2 instances, we thought maybe we should try this for Lambda too. So we deployed um, it to 1% and then to 50%. And then we noticed things were twice as slow at the 99th percentile, which means that we're not actually getting cost savings because Lambda does build by the millisecond and we are delivering inferior results, which you can see here. This is another great example of how we were able to use our error budget to perform this experiment and observe it for a while. And then we had the controls to immediately roll it back. And you can see as soon as we turned it off, uh, it just turned off. It's updated the flag at 6.48 p.m. And at 6.48 p.m., you see that orange line just go to zero. Uh, and if you can't, hopefully you can see, but these are the purple line is um, AMD64 and the orange line is just the ARM64. So after that, we decided we were not going to do experiments 50% at a time because um, that little experiment there made us burn through half of our error budget. <laughs> so we started doing some more rigorous performance profiling in order to, enter, to identify the bottleneck. So we turn on for a little bit and profile and turn it back off. That way we get both safety, stability, and the data that we need to safely experiment. If any of you have ever worked on databases or you know low-level storage stuff, you know that there's just there is no <laughs> there's no substitute for being able to profile in production and being able to do that safely without impacting your users is is a bad thing. Chaos engineering is something to do once you've taken care of the low hanging fruit, right? But once you're not in a, in a state of catastrophe, once you know, you're able to plan your work instead of just reacting all the time, it, it really is you know, a game changer. Um, and it only works if you have observability, of course. Otherwise, you're just throwing more chaos into the mix and you can't see with fine-grained enough um, results in order to actually make the right conclusions from it. But takeaways are, right, 
um, if you're running your continuous delivery pipelines throughout the day, then stopping them should be the anomaly, not starting them, right? By designing our delivery pipeline for reliability through the full life cycle, we've ensured that we're mostly able to, you know, to, to keep going no matter what. Feature flags keep us within our SLOs most of the time by managing the blast radius. Even when software flags can't do the trick, there are other infrastructure level flags and things you can do, like running special workers to segregate traffic that is especially risky. By discovering our risk at 3 p.m., not at 3 a.m., it ensures that the customer experience is much more resilient and it makes sure that you're already always designing for peak traffic. And it makes sure that your people are actually seeing these problems while they're fresh, while there are lots of people around, while you can tap experts, et cetera. But black swan events happen. SLOs are a guideline, not a rule. You don't have to say, okay, we're switching everyone over to reliability work because we blew our SLO. If you have something like, like the massive Facebook DNS outage or BGP outage, right? It's okay to just hit reset, reset on your error budget and say, you know what? That's probably not gonna happen again. SLOs are for managing predictable-ish risks. Um, there are lots of other risks that are not very predictable. So um, if you do this continuously all the time, I just think this is funny, a, con a conversation like this becomes no longer preposterous, <laughs> right? This actually would be chaos engineering, not chaos. Um, we have the ability to measure and watch our SLOs, limit the blast radius, carefully inspect the results. That's what makes it actually reasonable to say, hey, let's DOS our own services. Let's try restarting the workers every 20 seconds and just see what happens. Worst case, I'll just hit control C with this group. SLOs are an opportunity to have these conversations and find opportunities uh, to move faster and talk about the re trade offs between stability and speed. There are creative things we can do to say, say yes to both. And testing production is fun and good for customers. You know, in the end, this is all about, you know, you know, I talk about observability all the time. Um, and I just kind of wanted to give a picture for what it looks like when you're on a team that is, you know, it's not just observability. I feel like observability needs to come first because it's such a force amplifier for all the other tools and all the other changes you may, you may bring into your system. But it's, you know, over the past five years, there's been this enormous, this enormous like swing of the pendulum away from, you know, pre-production pre -production stuff to focusing on, you know, production hardening and, and you know, what's going on in your systems right now. That, that means feature flags, that means observability, that means, you know, chaos engineering, that means, you know, CICD that automatically deploys to prod that, that doesn't require manual. There, that means um, progressive deployment. You know, there's so much going on. And working on a team that's embracing this, working on a team that ships the production in 15 minutes or less is um, once you've worked that way, you'll never want to work any other way. And if you're a senior technologist, whether you're a manager or you know, an engineer, there's a lot that a single engineer can do in a single afternoon to, to you know, make the entire team run better. And as far as I'm concerned, like this is an ethical issue because it all comes down to you know, better lives, less time spent at work, more, high, more time spent being incredibly productive at work and less time just like flailing and you know, fixing things over again and trying to orient your time and yourself in time and space. So TLDR. The end. <laughs> Do we have the ability to get questions? We have some time for questions. Thank you. That was a great talk. And I especially love how easy it is to integrate Honeycomb um, into your into your system just by uh, getting some pre-made connectors and how it integrates into like every level from Postgres to um, you know the HTTP server and all this other stuff. Like you don't really. I'm I'm used to writing all of this code to like write all this tracing into the thing and like having like a tracking ID. And the fact right. that you can get it for free is um, really wonderful. Thank Let's you. see. Uh, okay, I don't think we have a lot of questions. Is anybody typing? Any questions about anything? Doesn't even have to be about the talk. Do you want to know about? open telemetry or do you want to know about um, 
wow, there are no questions. I'm going to assume I put everyone. Somebody, to sleep. Somebody's typing. Somebody's typing. <laughs> Sometimes that happened. That happened on the keynote too. Let's see. <laughs> All right. Hiring team practices, anything? Guess not. All right. There's two people typing now. There's, okay. there's people typing. Okay. Was there a time when you didn't realize you could build and deploy like this? How long did the transition take? Was there, well, I mean, at Honeycomb or just in general, obviously, like I've spent the, you know, my career, just like everyone, like learning and growing. Um, how long did it take? Okay, I'm going to assume that the question. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, sure, absolutely. Uh, so my last job before Honeycomb was I was working at Parse. I was their infrastructure, was their first infrastructure hire. And um, that was in like 2011 or so. Yeah, that's about right. And, you know, Parse was a mobile backend as a service. It was like Heroku, but for mobile apps, right? You have APIs and SDKs, you write an app using them, I take care of the backend. And, you know, I think we had pretty good, you know, I, I, I own deploys. Um, I ran them every day, you know, once a day. So like all your changes would batch up and I push about every day. You know, like we had pretty decent, you know, uh, practices for 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 the time, but um, as as we started to take off, we got more and more mobile apps. Um, our ability to understand what was going on in the system just disintegrated. You know, every every day a new app would be hitting the top ten in the iTunes store, right? And and everything would get slow, and parts would go down, and because everything was slow, everything was slow. It, you know. So we were using like a, a pool of HTTP workers and, you know, if, if anything on the back end got slow, they would fill up within seconds and then parse would go down, like boom. And we had like, you know, 60,000 mobile apps. It's like, which one is causing it? They're all slow because they're all slow, right? Um, that's the experience that led me to start Honeycomb. You know, parse got acquired by Facebook. Um, <laughs> so not consensually on my, my part, but neither here nor there. Um, you know, and we were in like a six month reliability lockdown. We didn't ship any product because it's all about getting control of our, of our outages. And, you know, pay, Facebook was pushing these tools in us. There was this one tool that they, they pushed in us that it's called Scuba. Most of the tools we didn't actually use, but Scuba, like we started feeding some data sets into it. And the time it took us to figure out, you know, which app had caused the slowdown or which app was it fault or whatever, um, suddenly it started to drop like a rock, like, like from, hours, days, who knows, right? To like, not even minutes, like seconds. Like it wasn't even an engineering problem anymore. It was a support problem. And that made an, a huge impact on me, right? When I was leaving Facebook, uh, I, I've i never been one of those kids who's like, I'm gonna start a company. Like I kind of loathe the whole founder industrial complex. Most of these kids I do not want to play with. Um, but I was leaving Facebook and I went, oh shit, like, I don't know how to engineer anymore without this tooling. Like it's become so core to not just how I, you know, like recover when the system is down, but like these are my five senses for production. This is how I, this is how I know what's happening. This is how I decide what to work on. This is how I know what I'm doing is being done correctly. This is how, you know, it's just the idea of going back to not having it um, is, is just like, you know, it would be, <laughs> my ego couldn't take it. I was so much less powerful as an engineer, right? Um, and that's when I decided to make, start Honeycomb because, you know, there's a lot, I'm not claiming that observability is all of it, but observability is really where it starts because, you know, if, if you're someone who wears glasses like me, then you'll understand why, you know, just being able to see what the fuck is going on is so clutch. If you can't see you can't respond. If you can't see, you can't, you, you aren't writing on the, you aren't working on the right things. There, I don't know how many times, you know, how many hours, how many days worth of hours I have wasted, you know, working on the wrong thing. I don't know. What I'm trying to say is, yes, absolutely. The last, I've been doing this for like six and a half years. Uh, and in the beginning, I honestly thought that this was just going to be a super rare problem that only very large platforms had. But it turns out, but it's an everybody problem because everything is a high cardinality problem these days. Everything is high cardinality. And if you don't have that, you're, you're kind of screwed. You can't actually debug your systems. All right, that was a very long-winded answer. 
Um, you made the statement never alert on symptoms. Absolutely, um, never alert on CPU or you know memory or any of these things. Alert on are my users in pain? Like this is the only way to scale your systems. It's the only way to scale your your team is to use SLOs and to change from alerting on symptoms because there are a lot of symptoms and most of them are um, do not actually correspond with user pain. You're going to have times when your CPU is spiking. You know you're out of memory, or whatever. And your users, you know, they're actually, they're, there's, there's not even a spike in errors. And then there's gonna be a lot of times where, like, there are more times when everything is fine according to your symptoms, but your users are in a lot of pain, right? They're, they're only very loosely coupled. Um, and if you want to scale your teams without burning them out, without having a lot of false positives, without having a lot of like automatic, you know, the pages that, re that fix themselves just as soon as you get up, you have to switch to error budgets and alerting only on user pain. All right, we have one last question. Did you need to build up an automated test suite before you started continuous deploys? If so, how no. did you take those first steps? And what level of no, testing did you need before you felt confident in continuous deploys? Sorry, big question. It's all right. No, because we didn't have any users, so that made it super easy. This was like, you know, two weeks after we started the company uh, that we did continuous deployment. Um, that said, even if you know, if I was introduced, if if we didn't have it, I would do whatever it took to introduce that now. Yes, you absolutely need to have tests that you're that you know need to. This is not a replacement for testing; it's a yes and. Um, but I would do whatever it takes to get automatically. The only point of CI/CD is to get your systems and your software primed to to deploy automatically. Saying oh, it's ready to be deployed at any point doesn't fucking cut it. Sorry, I'm doing math. It doesn't cut it. It's not the same. You don't know until you've tried. Um, I, I feel very strongly about this. Like within 15 minutes after you've merged your code domain, it should be automatically deployed to production. Um, I have, if, if, you want, if you want to see my rant on this, um, check out my slides on speaker deck. I have a whole talk, I have a whole talk about fulfilling the prop of CICD and why, because honestly, like if it takes X number of engineers to build, ship, and maintain, you know, a piece of software, if it deploys in 15 minutes or less, uh, if you deploy in the order of hours, it takes twice as many people. If you deploy in the order of days, it takes twice as many again. Weeks, twice as many again. You're wasting so many cycles, just like waiting on each other and having to develop like specialties and everything. Uh, the the best way to run efficiently is to make sure that you're deploying automatically within 15 minutes. It's the number one thing anyone can do to have um, a higher performing team.